We have one more speaker before we take a brief break and head over to the luncheon. Matt Leopold is a longtime Florida Federalist, well known to many in the room. He's one of the highest ranking Floridians in the president's administration, serving as general counsel to the United States Environmental Protection Agency. He's a graduate of the University of Florida. He previ previously served as general counsel to the Florida Department of Environmental Protection and as an environmental policy advisor to Governor Jeb Bush. Matt also had a distinguished career in private practice. There have recently been some major regulatory developments at the EPA, and we have the privilege of having Matt join us today to share a little bit about those developments. Please join me in welcoming Matt Leopold. Good afternoon. It's, it's, uh, I'm not going to repeat the joke about standing between a crowd and lunch, uh, but you've all heard it before. I want to thank uh, Jason and Jesse and the Federal Society for inviting me to be here once again. And uh, I want to thank the last panel because um, I'm used to being one of the most controversial speakers on EPA's environmental policy, but uh, it's, it's good to follow another panel where there's a good, healthy dose of controversy. Um, I attended this conference two years ago, and I was with the administrator at the time, and he spoke about Made the major effort underway to provide regulatory relief to the economy while maintaining our commitment to essential environmental protections. Over the course of this administration, EPA has finalized 49 new regulatory actions that will save the con economy more than $5 billion in regulatory costs. And we have 47 additional actions in development to save billions more. And in a recent report, uh, on the president's two-for-one executive order, uh, it found that EPA has exceeded uh, the two-for-one uh, regulatory uh, replacement order. Thank you. And we've done this um, while America still sets the gold standard for environmental protection in the world. And I just want to give you a couple statistics on that. Um, according to the World Health Organization, we have the best access to clean drinking water in the world. And we also have among the best surface water quality in the world. Um, and it's EPA's 50th birthday this year. And since 1970, this country has reduced air pollution by 74%. And that's while our economy grew at 240%. And, so, and additionally, despite what you may hear in the press, the United States has reduced its greenhouse gas emissions more than any developed country in the world. So at, at the EPA, we fundamentally believe that environmental protection and economic growth are compatible goals. So I'm here today to tell you about one of our most signature accomplishments in this administration. Um, and after three long years of work, last week the EPA and the Army Corps of Engineers signed the Navigable Waters Protection Rule and to replace the Waters of the United States definition and clarify the limits around federal control under the Clean Water Act. <laughs> After 45 years of constant litigation and regulatory uncertainty, our new rule brings clarity and predictability to American farmers, landowners, and businesses. And no offense to those in the room, but we designed the rule to significantly curtail the need to hire teams of attorneys to tell landowners how to use their own land. In 2015, the EPA under President Obama issued a rule um, that expanded Washington's reach into privately owned lands, a move that left American, Americans, including our farmers, confused and uncertain about where federal jurisdiction ended and where the state's authority begins. Well, there, there was no clear mapping of the, the scope of that rule. Uh, the Pennsylvania Farm Bureau estimated that waters within 99% of the state's land area could have fallen under the purview of the 2015 rule. And in Missouri, it was estimated that waters and wetlands within 95% of the state's land area could have been covered. Simply put, the 2015 rule was a federal land grab, and we repealed it last fall.
Our replacement, the Navigable Waters Protection Rule, ensures that EPA is consistent with the statutory authority granted by Congress and the legal precedent set by uh, key Supreme Court cases. Congress in the Clean Water Act explicitly directed the agencies to protect, quote, navigable waters. Our rule does that and covers those additional waters and wetlands necessary to protect the navigable waters. For the first time, the agency uh, is streamlining the definition into four distinct categories. First, traditional navigable waters. Second, tributaries. Third, lakes, ponds, and impoundments and finally adjacent wetlands. The rule also provides clear exclusions for many features that traditionally have not been regulated and it defines terms in the regulatory text that have never been defined before. Um, the new rule will protect the environment and our waterways while respecting the states and private property owners. States have their own protections for waters within their borders and many already regulate more broadly than the federal government as, as he, we do here in Florida. Um, the Navigable Waters Protection Rule recognizes this relationship and strikes the proper balance between Washington, D.C. and the states. It clearly details which waters are subject to federal control under the Clean Water Act and importantly, which waters fall solely within the state's jurisdiction. So I want to tell you for a moment about the legal underpinnings and, and how we got here. And the debate over the, clean, the scope of the Clean Water Act has a long and tortured history. And it culminated in an infamous plurality opinion by the U.S. Supreme Court, which was, uh, was a 4-1-4 vote, and uh, known as Rapanos v. United States in 2006. Shortly after being elected, the president issued an executive order in February of 17, entitled Restoring the Rule of Law, Federalism, and Economic Growth by Reviewing the Waters of the United States Rule. That instructed EPA to consider Justice Scalia's plurality opinion when crafting our rule. This rule does so, and it also respects the concurring opinion of Justice Kennedy. The unclear Rapanos decision, with no clear majority, set off waves of litigation around the country as to the scope of federal waters. And as the Chief Justice observed in 2016 in the Army Corps v. Hawks decision, it is often difficult to determine whether a particular piece of property contains waters of the United States, but there are important consequences if it does. The Clean Water Act imposes substantial criminal and civil penalties for discharging any pollutant into waters covered by the act without a permit. Justice Kennedy and his concurrence in Hawks also seemed to realize the problem that had create, been created by Rapanos, and he said the reach and systematic consequences of the Clean Water Act remain a cause for concern and continue to raise troubling questions regarding the government's power to cast doubt on the full use and enjoyment of private property. But I think Justice Alito said it best in his concurrence in the infamous Sackett v. EPA decision when he said the combination of the uncertain reach of the Clean Water Act and the draconian penalties imposed for the sort of violations alleged in this case still leaves most property owners with little practical alternative but to dance to EPA's tune. Well, today, I stand before you, and I can officially declare those days are over. We have, we have crafted a clear rule consistent with Congress's direction in the Clean Water Act that promotes clarity and certainty for the regulated community. So I just want to lay out a few important principles in the un underpinnings of the rule. First, uh, the power conferred on agencies to regulate on, under the Clean Water Act is grounded in, co in the Congress's commerce power over navigation. And the agencies can choose to regulate beyond those navigable waters, um, including some tributaries and connected waters, but we must have a reasonable basis grounded in the statute. We can also choose to regulate adjacent wetlands, and we do, and, um, and those, those waters that are known as inseparably bound up in the court's Riverside Bayview opinion. But our new, new rule takes for the first time seriously the Supreme Court's admonition in 2001 in the Swank v. Army Corps of Engineers case that called into question EPA and, and the Army Corps' constitutional authority to regulate non-navigable, isolated wetlands that lack a significant connection to traditional navigable waters. We are not regulating isolated waters under this rule. <coughs> Second, thank you. 
Second, the Supreme Court recognized 150 years ago the distinction between federally, federal waters traditionally understood as navigable and waters subject to the control of the, United, of, of the states in a case known as the Daniel Ball. Our rule for the first time recognizes and respects the primary responsibility of states to regulate their land and water resources as reflected in Clean Water Act Section 101B. The Clean Water Act designated states as essential partners in water quality protection. Unlike the 2015 WOTUS rule, we made sure that the federal government does not supplant the fundamental state authority to regulate land use. And so the new definition uh, and the four, clear, the four categories are this. Uh, the traditional seas and traditional navigable waters are those tidally influenced water bodies and rivers and lakes used in interstate or foreign commerce, like the Mississippi River, the Great Lakes, Chesapeake Bay, and the Erie Canal. Tributaries is defined as rivers and streams that contribute surface flow to a traditional navigable water in a typical year. And a typical year is, to, is when precipitation and other climactic variables are within the normal range over a 30-year period. And this science-based principle we put in the rule to ensure that when the Army Corps measures jurisdiction, they measure at the right time, not in periods of flood or in periods of drought, but at, in a normal period of precipitation. But let me emphasize that these naturally occurring tributaries must also flow more often than just when it rains. Tributaries must be perennial or intermittent. As a fundamental principle, we do not regulate the mere ephemeral features that flow only in response to rainfall, including ephemeral streams, swales, gullies, rills, and pools. The third category is lakes, ponds, and impoundments, such as Lake Okeechobee and smaller lakes here in Florida that have a, a surface water contribution uh, to uh, navigable water in a typical year. And we have, in the fourth category, we have clarified adjacent wetlands under this rule. Wetlands must abut, meaning they must physically touch other jurisdictional waters to be adjacent, which ends the broad approach in the 2015 uh, Waters of the United States rule. The other important aspect of our rule is it's categorical. Um, so unless you're one of the water bodies that I listed in those four categories, you are out. You are not waters of the United States. Unlike the prior WOTUS regime, which left significant case-by-case -case determinations in the field and caused uncertainty for landowners, this distinction will provide clarity that where a water feature is not identified in our final rule, it is out. The final rule also does not regulate groundwater or diffuse stormwater or directional sheet flow over uplands. And for the environmental lawyers in the room, uh, we have significant, a significant number of exemptions to help the farmers that feed America and other critical activities, such as farm and roadside ditches are excluded. Prior converted cropland that was drained or manipulated before 1985 for agricultural purposes is excluded. Artificially irrigated areas are excluded Artificial lakes and ponds and farm ponds are excluded. And here, importantly, in Florida, stormwater features excavated in uplands are excluded. So with this final rule, there is finally a clear distinction between federal waters and waters exclusively subject to the control of the states. The final rule protects the environment and appropriately identifies federal waters, providing certainty and predictability for the American people. And many states, like Florida, have their own regulations that protect waters within their borders, <clears throat> or, or and and it, this rule does not uh, regulate those waters. Um, the federal government remains committed to providing funding and assistance to any and all states to enhance their capacity to regulate, protect, and res restore their waters. And our regulation, together with states, will provide a network of protection for the water resources within constitutional limits and those established by Congress in the Clean Water Act. Thank you for joining me today, and thanks for the opportunity to speak to the largest FedSOC conference of all the states. Thank you.